So lists for storing a variable number of elements. Lists are the most common type of data structure in most functional programming languages. 90% of what you're going to be doing is manipulating lists in some way, shape, or form. Lists in Erlang can hold, again, arbitrary data structures. So the, a list, you know, just to show you what the, this thing is. I just started using this uh, presentation software. So All right, so lists in Erlang can just be instantiated. Uh, lists can hold terms. So if I was to formally define um, what a list looks like, it looks like this. So a list can hold a term, and this pipe operator is a, is a, is a pattern match operator. It's not you know, some sort of algebraic type notation. It, it just basically um, is a, uh, a uh, cons operation in, in Lisp. Or it, it essentially appends lists together and can also be used uh, in the reverse in a pattern match to break them apart, and I'll get into that a little bit later. But what this essentially says is, if I was defining this as a string on a line of documentation as, as a uh, specification for what a list, a list is, a list is enclosed by square brackets to denote it. It can hold a term, which means a term is integers, flows, atoms, tuples, tuples of tuples of lists of tuples, whatever, it, anything. Uh, and then that's followed by the rest of the list, which is always ended by the, you know, the empty. So every list you ever you ever use has an empty list implicitly defined in the end, and you'll see why as we get into well the real reason why is this mathematical uh, business that all this is underpinned on, but it has a practical purpose as well. So again, I can list list can just be instantiated. Do you name the list? What's that? Do you name the list? Like if I want to name the list. We'll get into that in a little bit. You know, I can say bar, or I can say something like head of bar. Oops. HD. HD. Hello. Okay. Now, at the bottom, you see this A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I thing. And then you see equals this big long bunch of numbers. So if you recall back to that character operation where you know we had a dollar and a capital A, and I said that was an integer. Well, in Erlang, lists are string. Lists and strings are the same thing. So strings are just a special form of lists. A string is a list that contains numbers that all range within the bounds of, of ASCII. And you can then take that list and pretty printed and it will show you the, it'll convert it into ASCII characters so that it looks like a string. But strings and lists are exact same thing. So if you want to see you know, what operations work on strings, you can look at the list module. There's also a strings module and if you want to use that on lists that are not you know, ASCII, fine, go ahead. Uh, you, can, you can do that there, interchangeable. That did, you know, there's a certain elegance to that and then there's a certain uh, there was there was a certain elegance to it back in you know like '89, um, but then Unicode and things like this started to emerge, you know, and, and gain prominence due to necessity and globalization and so on. And you know now it, it's a little bit dated. So Erlang has finally offered Unicode support in the form of a library, but for everyday programming, this can be uh, still still. And then that last little bit there, um, so double quotes, if a string is a list, double quotes equals the empty list, it's the exact same thing. Okay, so now let's get into variables, which I kind of highlighted just a minute ago in the, in the terminal. A variable is, I, I put this little thing after it, not very variable. So I say not very variable because uh, variables in Erlang are logic variables. So the the standard way that they're explained in the community is that they're they're kind of like the variables you have when you, you know when you when you started learning uh, math or algebra. You know you couldn't have x in an equation and then 
you know, like halfway down the, the equation, just change the value of x. That didn't make a whole lot of sense. Like, if x is one, then x is one throughout the whole equation. Otherwise, you can't do any sort of, you know, you can't. It, nothing makes sense at that point. And then, for whatever reason, uh, as Joe Armstrong likes to say, we in computer science we decided to turn that on its head and you know tell you you can change x and make x, y, and z and do it as many times as you want. Well, in Erlang you can't. Uh, a variable is what, what they call a logic variable. You set it once and it's that forever. So these and that that has benefits and they'll show up in a little bit. So a variable is anything that starts with a capital letter. <clears throat> so this first thing up here, this A B C, that's a variable. Below it, this a long non-standard variable name is also a variable. But in Erlang, we don't express variables with underscores. We express them in the same way that many people uh, write object names in other languages. So a variable is starting with a capital, and then each word in the variable will continue on, and the first letter will be capitalized. So the third, the third one is a proper Erlang variable name. It starts with an uppercase letter. Uh, no funny characters. You can, however, put numbers in it. Uh, but, you know, you can't put uh, at signs and things like that. And, you know, variables are used for what you'd expect them to be used for. Store their data structures as kind of named placeholders for other things. Okay, and complex data structures. This is just to demonstrate uh, what I talked about earlier, which is lists and tuples, which are your fundamental aggregate data structures, hold terms. So here we have a list that holds a number of terms. So this would be a, you know, this could be a record in a database, or you know, the fundamental data structure of some program that we wrote that was a, uh, you know, a, a contact manager or something along those lines. And you can literally just declare things like this. If I were to write this in an Erlang program and in front of it stick a, a variable. I could just store this as it's written. And that helps with the literacy of the program. So when you come along later and you look at this, you can see exactly how the variable is constructed. You can see exactly how the structure is constructed. It, it doesn't look like a function. It looks like a structure, which is what it is. So does anybody have any questions up to this point? This is, I know, a pretty rapid covering of all the data structures. We're going to move into some actual language stuff after this, so let's get the questions out of the way. Yes? I guess it's just a simple question. How much the naming convention is enforced by the language? I'm sorry, just say how that. Much, how much the naming convention is enforced by the language? Nothing. Okay. Nothing. Um, so Erlang is a language of idioms, and it, it's not a language that tries to enforce a lot. And that's one of the things that can make Erlang difficult, especially for the beginners. Pay attention as, as strictly as you can to what the conventions are, and if you do start programming Erlang and use it outside of this class, pay real strict attention to what the conventions are. Read the style guides, take a look at people's code that know what they're doing, and follow those conventions. Use OTP, follow the patterns that are out there, because it is possible to create a mess in Erlang. Um, you know, it, the language itself goes a long way to you know, managing state, to uh, getting rid of side effects and doing things like this, but I've seen lots and lots of messy code. Uh, recently, I, I saw the code of a, a bunch of airline code that caused the company to end up having to fire all those developers and, and go with Java because it was so bad. So, you know, you can write horrible, horrible airline code. Um, you can also write extremely beautiful airline code, and it's very easy to do so, but one of the things that's required for that is to pay attention to some of the idioms that are 